Welcome to our fifth and final session of a season of prayer. I hope you've found this comforting and encouraging, your prayer life able to grow, and uh, most importantly, finding some peace and, and comfort in uh, these difficult times. The idea of a season of prayer has come from the fact that we've lived through uh, three-fourths of a really unusual year, and this year we have elections coming up, which is important in our nation, as well as the holidays coming up and some uncertainty about what people are going to be able to do or not able to do for the holidays. So we thought it was important that we spend some time addressing the idea that we can come, uh, converse with God about these things and find some help and some strength for those things. I want to introduce you to the idea of some very strange names or curiosity about names. George Herbert Walker Bush. Many of you know who that is. There might be some of you who don't recognize that name, but at one point he was called President Bush, one of the presidents of the United States in the recent past. The thing I find interesting about his name is four names for one person. There are other people who have interesting names, but they don't have that many. Uh, one of them is Moon Unit. Uh, Frank Zappa named his son Moon Unit. Moon Unit has a brother named Dweezil, and another brother named Ahmet, and they have a sister named Diva. Some very interesting names. I think names in some ways give us an idea of who a person is. And they help us develop some of our characteristic and our personality. You've probably met people and thought, their name doesn't suit them. Isn't it interesting that uh, some people we feel like their name is exactly who they are, and other people it just never quite suits them. Another person you may or may not be familiar with, Charles Philip Arthur George. Many of you probably don't know who I'm talking about, but you probably know who he is. He may not be very famous in one aspect, but in another way, everyone in the world seems to know who he is. Now, you might be thinking, now he's into this already, and I know he said that the title of his lesson was, I don't like the king. Well, that's why we're now getting to Charles Philip Arthur George. You more commonly know him as Prince Charles of England. In some rounds, he is not very popular. Uh, people don't care for him that much, and I don't know that much about it because I don't focus much on what's going on in England. But throughout history, people have looked to their kings and their queens with different views. And I wonder how many times throughout history someone has said, I don't like the king. Well, Charles is arguably set to be the next king of England. Some people try to put forth the idea he should not accept and let that pass on to the next generation. I don't know if you're aware of this or not, but Prince Charles is 71 years old. So some of that uh, idea comes from that. Some has to do with just his personal life. But if he does become king at some point of England, there are certainly going to be people who say, I don't like the king. Well, all throughout history, we have seen rulers that people have to endure more than celebrate or uh, admire. We find that to be an odd situation in America because we don't have a king. And we have a very unusual system of government. But I can recall several times in recent decades when a president was elected, and people would say, not my president. Well, as Christians, we really shouldn't be saying that, no matter who the president is. There's a certain amount of respect and authority that they deserve. When I was in the military, I learned a lesson there because there were people who didn't care for the president that was in office at the time. And our commanders told us, you respect the office, not the person. There's a great deal of wisdom in that. 
Jesus had to deal with these ideas even in his day. Rome ruled Israel, and Caesar was in charge. And there were a lot of people who did not care for Caesar. At one point, the Pharisees wanted to test Jesus, and they thought they could catch him and get him in trouble by trying to make him either say that he was going to speak something against Caesar or tell them that they didn't have to pay taxes. Well, in Matthew 22, verses 17 through 21, they came to Jesus and it says, Tell us then, what do you think? Is it lawful to give a poll tax to Caesar or not? But Jesus perceived their malice and said, Why are you testing me, you hypocrites? Show me the coin used for the poll tax. And they brought him a denary, and he said to them, Whose likeness and inscription is this? And they said to him, Caesar's. Then he said to them, Then render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. There's an underlying truth there to what Jesus says, and an incredible wisdom that he displays, as they're trying to trick him, but he was well aware of what they were trying to do. There's a foundational principle that goes underneath this, and Jesus was well aware of it. And we find that foundational principle later spoken of by Paul in, to the Romans. And all throughout the Roman world, there were people who opposed the Roman rule. But what Paul told the Romans in Romans 13, 1, just a portion of that, he says, there is no authority except from God. We may not like the government, we may not like the king. We may not like the president. But underlying it, God allows them to be in power. And that's something that we have to remember. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, Paul once again talks about this. In verses 1 and 2. And he says, First of all, then, I urge you that supplications, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people for kings, and for all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and, uh, and dignified in every way. I find it fascinating that Paul tells Timothy, and in turn those that Timothy is going to teach, that we need to pray for all people. But then specifically, he says, kings and people in high positions of authority. That means we need to be praying for our leaders. I've had difficulty with that. This is not an easy thing that Paul tells Timothy to do. Most certainly, Paul had difficulties with it himself. Here he was, a Jew, living in the Roman world and having to endure the Roman rule. They didn't treat Jews well. He had a little bit of an advantage having been born a Roman citizen but that didn't solve all his problems. We likewise might face that kind of a situation. We have some advantages, but we're not always treated to the greatest privilege within our society. But Paul says, pray for all these people and for our kings, those in high positions. In America, when it boils down to it, we, the people, are the government. That seems to be hard to believe sometimes because we have very little voice or very little power as individuals. But when we band together as a community, we begin to have influence. Paul tells us our biggest influence is to go before God. What we find is when we look to authority, whether it might be our parents, our boss, our teachers, administrators in school, the local police force, the governors, our mayors, the list goes on and on of people in authority that we have to uh, deal with in our life. Sometimes it could be very difficult to pray for those people, and yet that's what God tells us to do in his word. Pray for those people. Where does that boil down to? What is the point for us? Well, Paul tells us the point is that we can lead peaceful and quiet lives to be able to live a godly life and to live in dignity. 
So we bring those authorities before God so that they can be influenced by God's hand for His purpose, for His glory. There are a great many larger pictures in history that we cannot see the outcome. God knows what will happen eventually, and we may not. We have to trust God, have faith in Him, and follow what He tells us to do. Ultimately, it boils down to what we read in Psalm 22 and verse 28. No matter who the man, woman, or office is that we have to live with in this earthly life, eventually it falls upon God's shoulders and who He is and that we obey Him. In Psalm twenty-two twenty-eight, 28, it says, For kingship belongs to the Lord, and He rules over the nations. One of the things we might want to be praying for as we conclude this session and as within days our election is going to be coming up is that God rises up the leader that will bless his people. I don't know who that is and we don't as a group know. We might think we have uh, an idea but it could be one or the other. We just don't know. We don't know what the future holds but God does. So I want to encourage you to spend some time not only praying for the church, for your family, for the community around us, and for the world, but also for our leaders, that God will guide them, that they will be open to God's guidance, and that ultimately we can rest in the peace knowing that the kingship belongs to the Lord. I hope God blesses you in the coming months, and as this year ends and another begins, that you'll continue to keep praying and not make our season of prayer end after this evening, but that it continues on for each and every one of us through all the days of our lives. Thank you.